Hello and welcome. My name is Max Bruckner and today I'm gonna try to do something I've never done before. Um, I'm going to use an, a Rust game engine I've never used before using a paradigm I'm, I've never used before but I've heard of the entity component system paradigm and I'm going to try to do something that I've did before implementing a clone of the classic Pong game. Um, as of now there's not a lot that I know about the game engine but I do know something about Rust. Um, I just want to warn you if you're trying to watch this video to learn something it's probably not the right one but if you want to watch somebody else learn something and learn together then maybe it's the right thing let's see let's start with the introduction so bevy, bevy uh, essentially is a group of birds interesting let's go over to the setup I already created a git repository with an initial commit and one thing I still need need to do, I'm I'm, I'm using C line with the IntelliJ Rust plugin, so I need to ignore the um, dot idea directory. I'm gonna do this re uh, really quick. Ignore dot idea directory. So. Then again, what we still need is a Rust format Tommel. I'm just gonna rip it off from a different project of mine. So it should show up here, and it has. And I'm gonna do the same thing with an editor config file. So first of all, what is editor config? Editor config is a way to configure your editor um, automatically from the project that you're loading so you don't have to manually set things like indentation and stuff. So what I'm doing is uh, I am of the I, I'm absolutely convinced that tabs are the superior way of indenting your code because tabs are they have a semantic meaning of being indentation, which something like four spaces doesn't really have. I'm using Unix line endings, UTF-8, um, automatically removing white, sp uh, white spaces at the end of lines and inserting a f new line at the end of the file for all file types. That Most of that shouldn't be too surprising. In terms of Rust format, not sure what hard tabs means, but longer lines. I I I don't want to use eighty character lines. New line style. Yeah, stuff like that. Gonna commit that. Okay, so let's get started. Setup, I need Rust, I need an IDE. So, 
I'm not gonna enable fast compiles. Also, I don't want to use a nightly Rust compiler. So essentially what I'm going to do is uh, add the bevy dependency in my cargo toml. Come on, that's it. I'm using this way to specify the dependency because it will automatically use the latest version. At least the latest 0 0.1 version. And we're going to create our first app. Let's take a look at the documentation. I want to know what that prelude contains. So let's search for prelude and it contains a lot actually. Usually I don't really use preludes that much but if it doesn't conflict with anything I'm doing I mean I could as well use it. So let's go to our main file and add the bevy use bevy prelude star uh, asterisk actually just in, in German it's just called stern which means star so yeah so what's next we want to run an app what does this build return an app builder Oh, great. Let's just run it. Wait for it to compile. On their features page, they are listing fast compile times as one of their features. Productive compile times. I guess this only happens when you actually recompile changes because this wasn't really fast. 30 seconds on a 24 core CPU isn't that fast. So it doesn't actually run. Great. Yeah, nothing happens because we're not doing anything. So our, our program is split up into entities, components and systems. They're using the example of position and velocity as components which is actually something that makes a lot of sense in in the case of pong because the ball and pedals do have a position and velocity so let's see if position is actually already defined We have a position type uh, with a relative or absolute position. A style has a position. I want to know where the position style is used, uh, the position type is used, so let's take a look. Oh, actually, I don't think I can see the users of a struct uh, of an enum in uh, docsrs, so whatever. But we can create a position. Actually, right now I'm I'm not quite sure if 
I really want to use floating point numbers for my positions instead of integers, but, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, probably it might be a good idea because you can have smooth motion. But let's follow the tutorial. We are going to make a hello world system which just prints hello world um, essentially. It doesn't take any parameters and just prints hello world. Oh, they're, you, they're doing it all lowercase, but whatever. I'm using the idea Wim plugin, by the way, so I can use Wim shortcuts in C Lion. So now we want to add the system to the app. It takes a box of dynamic system. Oh. So I can take the hello world and convert it into a system. What they've probably done, which is quite clever, if it actually compiles, I'm not quite sure. Oh, it works. Oh no, that was a lot faster and it actually works. It prints hello world. So what they've done is probably write a trait that is defined for all fn types of some sort. Let's take a look at where system is coming from. Probably it, this is the trait we're, we're looking for, but I'm not sure. Oh, it's actually not. Looking for a method into query system, into for each system. Both have a system method. So this is implemented. Well, that's not very readable, is it? But it seems like it's manually impl implemented up to a certain length of function. Let's see what f where funk is coming from. Not sure. So essentially what they've done is automatically implement into query system and or into for each system on some predetermined versions of the fn trait or in this case fn mute and that way you can just call system on your actual function and it will automatically create a dynamic system so it's essentially a, a box of trait object of system which is a like polymorphism, not like it is actually polymorphism. Also, this pocket is kind of annoying, so let's get rid of it. Let's search for pocket. Pocket enabled false. That's it, it's gone. <laughs> Sorry, Mozilla, but I'm al already donating every month, so you have to excuse me disabling your revenue source. So now we have the hello world example. Let's just create a new commit. Add the, add the bevy dependency. And implement hello world system 
So, let's continue. My app as so my app has a schedule. That's how it was executed. An ordered collection of stages which each contain an ordered list of systems. Schedules are, are essentially the execution plan for an app systems. They are run on a given world and resources reference. So essentially what it internally probably does is add system to stage and we probably have some kind of default stage that is accessible from the actual app. So the app builder the app builder has a oh I'm I'm in, in the wrong documentation app builder has app system add system and what it does is it adds a system to the update stage. Great. As you can see, um, I, I really like to gra get a, a grasp of, so uh, of how something is actually implemented so I can get a better mental model when I'm using it later on. So we're creating our first components. Creating the whole world is great. Great. We we're, we're creating a struct person. I think I know where that is going. So, but what if we we want our people to have a name? In a more traditional design, we might just tag on a name string field to person, but other entities might have names too. For example, dog should probably also have a name. Yeah, so that's the, the point in, in entity component systems. It's it's data-driven, so you, you don't just stuff a lot of um, properties or attributes to one kind of class or something like that, but you have separate components that are stored together and you can perform operations on the list of components which is very cache efficient because they are right next to each other in the in the memory which really make if you if you're just iterating over it to do an operation really makes the caches and the memory prefetcher happy so your CPU, do, your CPU doesn't have to wait for your main memory. So let's just do what they're saying. Let's create a name and a person. String is in the actual standard library prelude so that doesn't need to be included. So we need to add people to our world using a startup system. Let's use commands. What are commands? A queue of commands to run the current world and resources. So I guess you can add commands to the end of it. Arc of mutex of commands internal. So this is actually behind a mutex. So not concurrently accessible. I thought they were saying they were working with log-free data structures, but whatever. So we can spawn commands and we actually need it immutably. And we can see that here, we get a mutable list of commands. So what we spawn is actually comp 
components, which is an impl dynamic bundle. A dynamic bundle is implemented for, let's say this. And a component is implemented for everything that is send and sync, which is like almost everything. Oh no, it actually has, needs to have a static lifetime, which is which is definitely a limitation. Types that can be components implemented automatically for all send and sync static types. This is just a convenient shorthand for send plus sync plus static lifetime and never needs to be implemented manually. Okay. So let's just do what they're saying and um, take a look at what it actually does. We have a function add people to world. We get a mutable set of commands, which we get by ownership. So it gets moved in. We don't return anything and we spawn a set of person and name. And I, I'm, I'm going to do a modification right here because we, at this point in time, we don't really need those names to be strings. We can just let them be static string slices. So we don't actually need to do any uh, allocations in this case. I'm not saying that you should uh, always micro-optimize like this, but in this case, it just makes sure that I don't have to call two string in this case. Um, what what is actually the name of our commands? Yeah, it almost looks like I've never written uh, Rust code before looking at what I'm doing here. Commands dot spawn. We're spawning a set of a tuple actually of person and a name. Let's let's say Alice, Bob and Charlie. And this is actually chainable because spawn returns a mutable reference to the commands, which is nice. So we're gonna have to probably add a startup system, which is add people to world. And we need to convert it to a system. I think the the reason why they are doing it this way is because this makes sure that there is no so 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 the add startup system method is not generic or at least not compile time generic over anything. So no static polymorphism, which means it only ever has to be compiled once so no code bloat and as the the main thing is there's no bloat in compile times and you you, you can't just automatically convert uh, or implicitly take a function as an as a box of s dynamic system or as as some trade object you first need to convert it into one. And what they've done is just made it easy to, to do that conversion by implementing a trait for a lot of function types that automatically provides this system um, method to automatically convert it into a trait object of system inside of a box. So, so a heap of allocation of a system trade object, a trade object being an a 
as a pointer essentially being a way to represent something that implements a trait without knowing its size or actual concrete type so like it's a kind of I think you would call it type erasure and it's a dynamic polymorphism because um, if you call a trait method it gets looked up in the trait object itself in a v table and um, so the the calls are looked up dynamically at runtime so we added the startup system and we add the hello world system did we have to modify the hello world system yeah of course it's not going to do anything that's So what they're doing is um, they're adding a greet people system, which works on a person, which we've added here. And it works on a name. This is quite interesting. I, I, am, I don't fully understand what it's doing yet but let's take a look greet people we get an immutable reference to a person which in this case is kind of pointless because it's a zero size type <laughs> it's probably going to be optimized out entirely because there's no point in passing a pointer to a zero size type and we get a name I mean probably we wouldn't have we wouldn't need to create the name type we, we could just have used a static string here I guess but if we were to do that it it would it would be less type safe because it would suddenly work on any static string slice and not just only on names so print line hello and name Okay, this is kind of horrible. No, I'm not gonna do that. Am I? What I could do is this. I could automatically unpack the name. No, that's not how it's done. I'm doing this. So I'm automatically unpacking the name. So what's happening is this isn't just able to be the name of a variable. It can actually be a pattern that is then automatically deconstructed so I can access the internals. Not sure if it compiles that way. I'm, I'm just going to take a look just complains about unused variables so it actually works like that it also automatically understands that I mean this is a, a copy type meaning that this can just be a copy I'm, I'm not sure what what this type actually is in the in the end but let's just execute the code Oh, we just want to greet the people. So add the system greet people. Convert, actually convert it and convert the function to a system. And people is the unused. That's not surprising. because they are just zero size types. Hmm. 
No, I'm not quite sure anymore what's actually happening. Print line. So, I, I guess this line will be executed. We are adding people to the world. We should still see that line of code. Oh, I didn't run it, I just compiled it. That's why nothing happened. I, I press this build button, but I actually had to need, needed to execute the actual code, which now does exactly what I expected. So the parameters we pass into a system function define what entities the system runs on. In this case, greet people will run on all entities with the person and name component. So essentially what our function or our system does is to automatically run on every single person. And I think there are queries we could can use to um, limit it to just specific kinds of person. Oh, and this all runs in parallel. Now I'm now I'm intrigued. I'd really like to spawn a batch. So we have an components iterator that is just of type into iterator. It should comp produce components. In that case, I, I actually need this to be a string. <laughs> but no worries, I can just use the into trait to automatically convert the string slices into strings. Should still compile and work. So now let's spawn a batch. First we need an iterator. I want to number them from one to whatever. So let's take like zero to, or not, not, not one to, but zero to 100. I'm always not sure about the actual syntax, but I think this should be it. I'm creating an iterator. So let people equals zero to 100 re uh, converted into an iterator. And I think I can just convert the number into a string and we should be almost done. So map to string to string and then just so this is a name and we're just gonna put a person and the name in here I mean this this could be done differently but hey and this is actually something I don't really like about rust format it just puts all of that in one single line. Oh, no, no, it doesn't. Wait, wait a minute. Rust format. Run Rust format on save. Let's take a look. Okay, this seems okay. Rust. The external limper, linter should be clippy on and not cargo check because clippy finds more bugs and we want to run it on the fly automatically. So that's better. 
So now we have an iterator of something that will be a component and we can just do spawn batch people. And this should just work. Or doesn't it? Oh, this is called two still. Or is it? Oh, it's not. I mean, I... Oh, yeah, two string, of course. But why isn't this working? This creates an I32, which should... Let's take a look. It actually worked. <laughs> so the primitive I32 type implements QRS. Doesn't implement two string? I mean, it should implement display, shouldn't it? Display. It implements display which means doesn't display automatically implement to string wait a minute implementers do i need some javascript no i don't Impl to string for t where t implements display plus it doesn't matter if it if it is sized or not. Which means this should actually work. Let's do it a different way. I have the number and I convert the number to a string. Okay, this actually works. Oh, I don't need Intuiter because it already is an iterator. Nice. But this should work like this. Maybe it does and it's just my IDE that's complaining. Oh, whatever. Let's just revert to the actual example. Or maybe just, just take, take another look at this. So what I've done is I've made people from 0 to 99 and printed them. Could also have done this, I guess. Was it like that? Maybe it was like that. It was like that. I I don't remember the syntax ever of, of this kind of operator. So now it starts at one and it goes to one hundred. But we're gonna turn back to the the names. So we can can continue following the example. Let's make a commit. Populate the world with people and greet them. So, next. Let's 
take a look at plugins. One of Bevy's core principles is modularity. All Bevy engine features are implemented as plugins. This includes internal features like the renderer, but games themselves are also implemented as plugins. This empowers developers to pick and choose which features they want. Don't need a UI, don't register the UI plugin. Well, actually, you could just implement anything in it, not just games, I guess. But not every workload um, is something that's great for entity component systems, I guess. So let's just enable the default plugins. And I guess it should create a window, as it says here, because it will create a window as the default plugin. Default plugins. Oh, and so now, using the default plugins, it actually prints all of the greetings over and over and over again. So essentially, from what I expect this to behave like, this should be drawing it on every frame it renders. Which my CPU doesn't really like it, actually. <laughs> yeah, this game engine is definitely parallel. This is quite impressive. We now have the window plugin. So, should we dig into the plugins that we're actually using? I'm not sure. Let's take a look at, at default plugins. And again, I'm in the wrong crate. So we have an app builder with its at default plugins method. And what it does is it adds these plugins. And also based on which features are enabled, it, it's different features or different plugins, essentially. Let's take a look at the default features. So let's take a look at Bevy on GitHub. It should be somewhere. Community? GitHub. Yeah, that's it. So the cargo.toml. Yeah, audio is actually one of the default features, so it's set up for making it easy to start and you need to manually disable the features, I guess, if you don't want to use them, which, it's, which is quite a nice approach, I guess. So now we're just writing the Hello plugin. Essentially, a plugin seems to be a struct. Are all structs... Is this actually a, an entity? I guess it is. Is it? I'm, I'm not quite familiar with the concept of entity component systems yet. Oh no, it, it cannot be an entity because an entity has actual state, which makes sense. I mean, it needs to have an ID. Can't I look at the source code? Ah, 
essentially I, I can't not that easily at least so let's write our hello plugin so in order to write a plugin we need to what they are calling implement the plugin interface which essentially means we are implementing the plugin trait so a plugin has a build method that works on an app builder actually a, a mutable reference to an app builder mutable borrow so we can do whatever we want with our app using the plugin builder and we need a name but that is automatically provided which is strange how is it actually how is it provided maybe it has a default name i'm not sure So we're building our hello plugin. And we are implementing the plugin trait for the hello plugin, which means we need the build method. So we're just putting the stuff we were doing in here, which makes a lot of sense. So we have our app and no, I want to use tabs. Thank you. So we have our app app builder not sure why the ID isn't working no, no it's working um, we add the startup system and add our other systems and we can now just add it back as a plugin add plugin hello plugin that's it nice and it should now do the, the, the absolute same thing it did previously. Just hogging CPU and printing stuff. So this, this is what we've done. On word greeting logic into a plugin. Entities and components are great for representing complex queryable groups of data, but most apps will also require globally unique data of some, ki of some kind. In Bevy ECS, we represent globally unique data using resources. Here are some examples that could be encoded as resources. I guess the way this is written, it should be really easy to test systems, I guess, because it's all completely functional. So some resources could be elapsed time, asset collections like sounds, textures and textures and meshes and renderers. So let's track some time. Let's solve our apps hello spam problem by only printing hello once every two seconds. We'll do this by using the time resource, which is automatically to, to our app via add default plugins. For simplicity, remove the hello world system from our, from your app. This way we only need to adapt the greet people system. Oh yeah. Not a problem. We've done enough enough hello world for now. So the system is adapted. 
by now taking an additional parameter, time res of time. Not sure why they want to call it res. They, they could have just called the type resource instead of res. I don't like these abbreviations. So let's take this and add the time, which is a resource of the type time. Where's time coming from? Oh, this is time. With an actual delta since the last update, so the last frame essentially, the current time and stuff like that. So now we have the time. So res and res mute pointers provide read and write access respectively to resources. Note that resources must come before components or your function will not be convertible to a system. So that's just how their uh, traits are implemented, I guess. I actually recommend that you try putting time res in an invalid position just so you know what an invalid system compilation error looks like. Let's, let's first compile it like that. So this is the way it's supposed to be used. And now put it in a different spot. Method not for, oh my god. Actually, that's not that bad for a, a Rust generic error message. But essentially it doesn't find the system method because for this combination of parameters, the the inter-system trait or what it was isn't implemented. So it cannot call the system method. So what's the actual trait? Let's take, take a look once this is, has compiled. Oh no, we need to stop it. Doesn't seem to be, seem to be too easy to resolve this. <laughs> Yeah, whatever. The delta seconds field on time gives us the time that has passed since the last update. But in order to run our system once every two seconds, we must track the amount of time that has passed over a series of updates. To make this easier, Bevy provides the, the timer type. Let's create a new resource for our system to track elapsed time with a timer. Oh, so this is actually a new resource. And this works via out parameters, which is kind of weird. Oh, so we actually need to tick the timer, otherwise the elapsed time isn't updated. Oh, so this is the timer. Yeah, great. So let's first add the the timer. Our, our greet timer is a new resource so we have a greet timer which contains a timer and we're adding a is it a timer or a time oh it's a timer so timer is actually a type from pr provided by bevy which looks like this. Tracks elapsed time, enters the finished state once duration is reached. Non-repeating timers will stop tracking and stay in the finished state until reset. Repeating timers will only be in the finished state on each tick duration. 
on each tick duration is reached or exceeded. I did the, this grammar doesn't make any sense. It can still be reset at any given point. But essentially, just finished is only set to true once ticked. Which is kind of weird, I guess. I mean, do we really want to tick it every time? Well, that, let's see. So the timer is a resmute of agreed timer. And first we want to tick it. Do we want to tick it? I think it needs to be mutable. Can't we tick it? How does this work? It needs a mutable reference to self and a delta time. I guess we need the delta first, so time dot delta seconds. I think the accuracy of F32 should be enough. So the delta is this, and we want the timer to be ticked with the given delta in seconds. Is it in seconds? Maybe. Oh, so we actually need to look inside of the re uh, we, we actually need to go inside. So if we actually want to access the timer, we, we, we cannot just access the internals of the timer. I guess resmute is some kind of access wrapper. Let's, let's take a look how resmute works. Unique borrow of a resource. Creating it is actually unsafe. But it implements deref and deref mute for t if t is a resource. A resource is almost anything. As long as it, is, as it has a static search duration and it is thread safe. So, yeah. And probably more because it could just be manually implemented. Could just be manually implemented for stuff. But in order to get access to the timer, we need to look inside of the greed timer, which is horrible syntax. But whatever, let's let's go with the example. So if it is finished, so this system is run every update, so every frame, I guess. And every frame we tick the timer, which currently I'm not sure if it's ticked for every single person or just once. And we tick it with the delta. Then we check if the timer is finished and only if it is finished we print the name. I hope that the time doesn't change in between calls to the, the delta seconds or uh, of the system because otherwise it could happen that not all of them are actually printed in a given frame. But I think they took care of this and made sure that this delta seconds is always the same for the same frame. 
but we could also just print the delta seconds, I guess. That would be interesting. So first, if timer dot zero dot finished, what's the difference between finished and just finished? Timer. Oh, so just finished will only be true on the tick duration. On the tick duration is reached or exceeded. So what about finished? Not sure. Also, where do we get our timer from? So if the timer is finished, we only then print and we also print the delta. Why is it? They haven't fixed the bug yet. That sometimes it doesn't use tabs. If I use the idea vim shortcut for creating a new line. But it works perfectly if I do it like this, whatever. We are printing the delta times because I uh, um, because I want to know if it changed between the runs of this method or this system. Now I'm curious if this will compile because I would expect it to not work. Yeah, exactly. The resource that does not exist. So the greet timer is never constructed anywhere. It wasn't added to the um, to the app, which means this works kind of like dependency injection, and it will automatically wire it up. And I'm sure they are gonna tell us how to do that. Add resource. Greet timer, timer from seconds, 2.0, true. What, what I kind of don't like about this is this way, I, usually when you, you when you use Rust, you have the ability to make the compiler check a lot of invariants. And in this case, it doesn't check that the resource is missing. You, you actually need to run it and experience the crash. But I... I guess this is fine because it will immediately crash on startup. But maybe if the system is used later on and not immediately at startup, let's say you you enter a different scene or stage or whatever the, the terminology is called, like you, you go from the menu to the main game, suddenly you register a system that requires a resource that hasn't been wired up yet, then it will just crash in the middle of it, which isn't that great. But let's just add our timer. So we've added our startup system. Maybe we just want to add the resource first, I guess. Come on. Add resource, greet timer, timer from seconds 2.0 and repeating is true because we want to print every two seconds and not just only once. It's compiling. And it kind of works, but it doesn't quite work the way I expected it to work. First it prints Alice all over, then Charlie all over.
strange. Oh, and now they mention it. The bug. I already noticed the bug, so what's going on? The, pr the problem is that the system runs once for each entity that has a person and name component. We have three entities that match this criteria, so on, e so on each update we are actually updating the timer three times. This also means that when a timer is finished, the first entity to update resets the greed timer and the other entities don't print their message. This means our other two people never get a chance to be greeted. That's not polite at all. We need a way for our system to tick the timer once per update, but greet everyone whenever the timer is finished. So this is where the queries are coming in, because we can make sure that the system is all is for every update only called once. Also, oh my god, it's still using the entire CPU. I guess we're going to be needing a, a some kind of FPS limit. So, let's use a query. Where's the query? Here's the query. Instead of just pay, taking a person and a name, we we use a query, a query system. Let's use that thing so let's replace this with a query let's call it all people so type say query off a tuple of a reference to a person and a reference to a name. So now we're only calling the delta, the, the tick method once. We don't have a name anymore. We are now using the system to, the query system to iterate over the people. So for person person and name in all people dot it iter I guess we want to print the name and we don't actually care about the person same as before that's a that's not it so we need to actually mutably borrow the query do we actually need to mutably borrow it seems like we do So this should now work as expected. Let's remove the data printing and it still uses half of my CPU. But we implemented a timer. Now that we have two different system types, how do you choose which one to use? Where's the different one? Oh, the standard default one is for each, and now I get it. This is largely an aesthetic question. Some bit developers will prefer the simplicity and legibility of for each systems and will use them wherever they can. Others will prefer the flexibility of query systems. There are no right answers here. You should use what works best for you. I get it. Next steps. Oh, that's the end of the book. Sad.
So now we have examples. I guess that's the next thing to take a look at. But this video is already one hour long. And we just finished the book. So I guess I'll end the video here. If you've actually been watching the entire video, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure there's anybody who would actually watch the entire video, but if so, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna continue in another video with um, looking at the examples at, and at some point I'll probably be able to implement Pong. I mean, I guess we already learned the basics of the entity component system and parts of how it was implemented. It, it's not that hard anymore to, to think of a way of how it could be structured. But anyways, um, I'm gonna end the video here. Hopefully see you next time.